for taking this Saturday, game day Saturday, to come and, and uh, attend this conference. I think you'll be uh, pleasantly entertained and educated today. We have some great speakers, some local, some from far away, and I'm not speaking, so you're really going to get some good information today. Uh, our first speaker has been in the community for quite a while, I've known Mark for a long time. He's a great guy. He is uh, one of the local podiatrists here in town. Went through a bachelor's degree at Loyola University in Chicago, stayed in the Chicago area, and did podiatry medicine at the William Scholl College of uh, Podiatry in, in Chicago. Two-year residency in uh, North Lake, Illinois, uh, completed in 1991, and then became a uh, podiatry surgeon in the Chicago area for a while. Married his lovely wife, I think, at about that time, and then they went to the, uh, who's a cardiologist here in town, went to the uh, Georgia area, been practicing a while down in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Yep, in the Atlanta, Georgia area. And then, fortunately for us, they both came up here to start practices in Ames, Iowa. Mark was with the McFarland Clinic for a while, but now he has a great, busy solo practice up there on 13th Street, up by the uh, Iowa Heart Center. And we're pleased to have him present to you a, a lot of information about diabetes in your feet. So welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me back there? Is that mic working? OK. No? How about now? Is that better? Great. Thank you. You should all be asleep in about 10 minutes the way I lecture. So. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming today. Um, of course, this is a subject near and dear to my heart, the diabetic foot. So I'd, I'll try to make it entertaining uh, and informative for you. We're just going to scratch the surface today. This won't be anything super profound or anything, but it, hopefully it's a very positive message. We're just lucky to be living at a time in the history of man where medicine is where it is. And it's going to be neat to see where it goes 10, 15, 20 years from now even. But things have gotten so much better. You know, unfortunately, in the old days when people had diabetes, usually that was a, not a good prognosis long term. You know, usually there was a lot of complications with that. Certainly, that's still probably a, an issue. But the likelihood of those severe problems is much reduced compared to the way it used to be. So we'll, we'll get into a few things today. But my take home message should be very positive. Um, I've got some really silly slides too, so forgive me. And I think there's two that are a little bit graphic, so I apologize. I know you just had breakfast. They're not horrible, but they're to prove a point. So, uh, first of all, we need our feet, guys. For everything we do, for overall good health, we need healthy feet. Almost every activity we do uh, requires us uh, being mobile. So, the goal, of course, is to keep your feet attached to your legs, and, and that's our, our main goal is in medicine as a podiatrist. That's a shameless plug for my son, the running back there, number 34, by the way. Um, you know, the problem with diabetes is that there's a huge correlation with diabetics having amputations of their feet and their, their legs. Um, of course, once this happens, that foot loss or loss of the ability to be amb ambulate and be mobile causes all other uh, problems with, you know, cardiovascular issues, you can't exercise and quality of life really, really becomes a lot uh, severely affected and much more poor. So to me, the primary goal is keeping people active and being able to be mobile and ambulate and exercise. And you're going to hear a lot about exercise later. Um, and basically, I love this saying by Ben Franklin, but it's very true. If we can prevent problems from occurring, we're way ahead in the game in this. So. I always think of Ben when we're kind of working with patients trying to keep people on the right path. Um, and basically it's prevention. We, we need to be proactive. There's a kind of a, an obvious statement, but it's very true. It's, it, you kind of have to control what you're able to control. We're not able to control everything. Maybe I'm a little bit of a control freak anyway. I've been accused of that. But uh, you have to do your part in all this. Sometimes things just come up and you have no control, and that's part of life. But we need to be proactive and you know, enjoy the ride along the way, like these people in Venice are doing. Um, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you are diabetics? 
kind of thought so. Okay, good. Um, obviously, it's, it's a big business in, in medicine. Um, they, we estimate, and this probably has increased since I got my numbers on this, but 15 to 20 million Americans have diabetes, and that is the size of the populations of, of New York and Chicago, which is pretty amazing. Um, and this is the sad part down here, 20 percent uh, of infected ulcers and in feet lead to amputation, and we'll talk a little bit about that down the road. Our goal, of course, is to prevent ulcerations and in turn prevent amputation. Um, and the number one complication of diabetes is foot ulceration. Um, so that's our primary goal. We have to prevent that at all costs. Um, and basically, the definition of an ulceration, just like in your stomach, it's basically a perforation. Same thing with your foot. It's actually, you lose that barrier of your skin. Obviously, your skin is a very important role player as far as reducing infection. So once, that, once that's been broken, uh, potentially infection can occur and sometimes uh, very quickly. Um, so the, the, the break in the skin leads to the infection, and unfortunately, this is another bad statistic, but 20% of infected ulcers lead to that amputation that we talked about. So here's my first bad slide, I apologize, but you can see that perforation in the skin down there on the bottom of the patient's foot. Um, that's a very common place for people to have a perforation. That's where your metatarsal bones come down and they allow you to pivot when you walk. And there's a lot of mechanical shear that goes on there every time you take a step. And it's amazing the wear and tear we get on our feet. A lot of people have calluses in this area. Um, calluses sometimes are a precursor to developing a hole in your skin or an ulceration. 20% um, of diabetic hospital admissions are because of ulceration slash infection, very high number. Um, and this is a kind of a staggering thing. The average cost of a two-year course of an ulceration is $28,000. I just put down a Nissan Altima. My son wanted me to put down a Honda Accord, but you get the idea. But that's, that's a lot of money. Um, so it is a serious business. Uh, these amputations that we talked about lead to these other problems. It puts a lot of stress on your heart and your, your vascular tree once you do have an amputation, just to get around. Um, and once you start losing that ability to be healthy and lose your aerobic activity, um, unfortunately, everything else starts to be affected very seriously. This is probably the worst statistic I've got here, so I put it in red. But after the first limb is amputated, within five years, it's about 50% chance that the other limb will be amputated. So obviously, we want to avoid these things at all costs. And I said this was going to be a positive lecture. I promise it is, but I just wanted to lay down some groundwork. Um, here's, here's the scenario, though. And this, we'll talk about pain quite a bit today, but the problem is people sometimes can't feel pain when you have diabetes with the neurologic complications. Um, unfortunately, once that happens, you get that whole perforation in your skin, an infection ensues, and then all kinds of fun starts to happen. That infection can spread to the deeper tissues. Typically, when it gets to a tendon, it can slide up your foot very quickly and cause some very severe effects in a very short period of time. Um, and then if bone gets involved as well, bone is a very living tissue. It can become infected. Um, and bone infections oftentimes require uh, pretty aggressive surgery sometimes and usually a lot of IV antibiotics and a lot of time uh, in the hospital, unfortunately. So our goal is to prevent anything from ever getting to that point. Um, the, the one thing that's kind of a home run here is that sensory neuropathy. That's the one thing we always need to focus on here. Um, I'm sure when you see your regular doctor or when you see me or another podiatrist, hopefully they have you take off your feet, your shoes, and uh, they examine your feet, and they always test your ability to feel things down there. Um, sometimes we'll use something like a tuning fork. It sounds kind of goofy, but that's one of the first things people start to lose when they start to develop a sensory neuropathy. They're not able to feel that vibration from the tuning fork. So we can kind of track things and get an idea where we're at when we do that examination. Um, there's a neat little study we use, with this little monofilament uh, wire. We, we touch your foot and put pressure on your foot. It's almost like a thick piece of fishing line. But that's also very helpful to kind of quantify um, how you're able to feel things, depending on how thick that piece of monofilament is. So there's some pretty good tests that aren't really very complicated that we can do to kind of get a good idea where you're at. Um, pain. Pain is actually a good thing. <laughs> Um, it protects you from injury. 
Um, for example, you're walking out to get the newspaper on the hot asphalt driveway uh, without your shoes on. Most of us would not be very happy to do that. I have baby feet. I hate getting my feet hot, so I would be off that driveway in two seconds. But uh, unfortunately, when you have diabetes and that sensory neuropathy, you're not able to feel that. Um, this is why people with diabetes uh, have so many problems with that. We've learned a lot about the diabetic foot from patients that have leprosy or Hansen's disease. Um, there, there's so many similarities as far as not being able to feel pain. Uh, unfortunately, people with leprosy lose that ability to feel pain very early in the process. Uh, and that's why they have so many problems with their skin and so many deformities occurring just because they're not able to protect themselves because of that lack of sensation. So pain is protective, pain is good. Uh, you don't think of it that way, but it is. So I, I love that picture of my son. I had to get that up there. So you, know, you don't think of pain as being helpful, but really it does protect us from problems. So this, we call this uh, phrase protective sensation, that ability, it's kind of the threshold point. If, if you're above that point, you're great. You can feel things, stimuli that would otherwise be very painful. For example, a shard of glass from a piece of glass that breaks in the kitchen, um, if that gets embedded in your foot and you're below that threshold, you have no idea there's anything wrong with you until you look down and your foot's red hot and swollen and might be draining. And you're like, well, what the heck is going on? I don't remember anything. It's that pain. Uh, a famous doctor, uh, Dr. Paul Brand, did a lot of work with uh, people with leprosy early on and kind of helped us with diabetes. But I love the saying is that pain is the gift that no one wants. But it's very true. We, we need to have that ability to feel pain. So this is my foot here, and I hate pain, so that should hurt. Um, people with diabetes have other issues, obviously, other than just that inability to feel pain sometimes, too. Um, the more risk factors you have, the greater potential you have to have problems. So we need to visit with those a little bit. Of course, I still feel, and I think a lot of people in my profession still feel, the biggest culprit is that sensory neuropathy. Unfortunately, if you combine that with some of the other things we'll talk about, uh, PAD or uh, poor blood supply from your, the arterial system in your, in your body, that's a huge complication to this. For example, let's say you, you do walk on a piece of glass in the kitchen, it becomes infected. If your circulation isn't adequate to help deliver enough nutrients to help heal that and blood flow to heal that, and if you're taking an antibiotic, if that is not able to get to that area where you need it, obviously we're in trouble. Other risk factors are foot deformities. I don't think I have any really nasty ones here. Um, but the deformity is a problem in that it causes pressure. And pressure is a bad thing like we talked about earlier with calluses on the bottom of your feet. Um, so the pressure can come from both sides. It can come from the top of the shoe rubbing against toes that are buckled. We call them hammer toes or may, many people have bunion deformities where there's kind of a knot on the inside of their foot. The shoe rubs against that, causes a blister first or redness, and then it can become an ulceration as well. Or you can kind of get problems from the, the bottom side, like we talked about, where there's callus formation. These calluses get to the point where they perforate. So here, this is not a garden variety foot. This is someone who had some interesting surgery done before. But, um, you know, certainly that foot right there is going to be very difficult for someone to be comfortable in a shoe with. And even walking barefooted, there's going to be some issues with that. So we have to be very careful with those folks. The other thing, too, though, we talked about sensory neuropathy. Sometimes we we'll even with diabetes have problems with what we call the motor nerves, or the nerves that help basically help stabilize the muscles that work the little ligaments, tendons, and bones in your feet. Tendons are nothing more than pulleys, basically. Muscles control the tendons, and if the muscles aren't working properly, we start to form imbalances. So someone can have nice, straight, perfectly straight toes, develop this motor neuropathy along with the sensory neuropathy, and over time, their toes really start to contract and buckle. That's going to be a problem fitting in shoes for sure. So uh, again, bunion deformities, hammer toes, and bony prominences, and by that I mean sometimes people have a huge knot on the back of their heel or the top of the instep of their foot where the shoe rubs against them, those can be very problematic once you lose that ability to feel pain. 
So here's just a, a little example of a bunion deformity. Um, it's a very high-tech term. The term bunion comes from the Latin word onion. So uh, I like how medicine does things sometimes. Um, this is a hammer toe where you can see, and that's a horrible name too. It sounds like some terrible deformity, but it just means that your toe is buckled. Uh, but basically, you know, with these neurological problems, we, get to, to pro we can also develop problems where um, the nerves that function to help sensory and motor problems with your feet also can affect blood flow to your feet. It's called the autonomic nervous system, but your blood vessels are actually regulated by your nervous system as well. When you start to develop the neuropathy, um, you can also have issues where these blood vessels normally should start to shut down and basically constrict, but they don't. You have increase in blood flow sometimes. We sometimes with the diabetic patients will see a foot that the patient presents with a very warm, hot, swollen foot. Your first concern is, oh my gosh, they might have a bad infection somewhere. So you really examine the patient's foot. There's no openings in their skin anywhere. Um, you're trying to get to the cause of the problem. But basically, it's caused by just this huge influx of, of blood flow. What will happen with this, of course, is that this blood flow is not checked. It increases the, the pressure within these areas of the foot. And even uh, the theory is that it can actually start to break bone down by kind of washing away mineral content in the bone. This will make the bone much more susceptible to fracturing. It's not going to be as strong having less mineral content. And the argument is if your mechanics aren't perfect, if you can't feel things very well, you start to walk on a foot that isn't as strong as it should be, and you can start to cause microscopic fractures in these bones of your foot. Um, there was a lot of work done on this. Uh, a gentleman, a neurologist from France, um, Dr. Charcot, did a lot of work on this, and basically we named this condition after his hard work. But it's a very common problem with diabetic patients. You get these little uh, fractures within these joints. Over time, the foot starts to break down and collapse. Interestingly, patients oftentimes have no pain at all with this. So it's, it's a little bit freaky when you first see that. I remember as a resident seeing a patient in the emergency room for the first time that had this condition. And it's pretty impressive. Here's an example of the collapse of the foot. You can see how that arch is really collapsed right in the middle there. Um, obviously, if you're walking on that, that's not going to be a good, a good long-term uh, issue. So the combination of this poor sensation in conjunction with deformities is bad. Um, this pressure can lead to the breakdown of skin, and it's a repetitive thing. It's over and over. Every step you take, we estimate people take 12, you know, 10 to 12,000 steps each day. That's a lot of wear and tear. Here's, here's the bad slide. I apologize for those eating breakfast still. But uh, it's to prove a point. That is a pretty uh, invasive ulceration on the bottom of that foot there. You can kind of appreciate the redness here as well, too. Um, at the periphery of that ulceration. That, and at any time we see dark discoloration within the ulcer, that's kind of a precursor to gangrene, where the patient's not getting adequate blood flow to that. That's, that's not a good long-term uh, deal for this patient, unless we really become very aggressive with this. So a couple things that we really need to work with today. You know, obviously, we want to make sure that people don't get ulcerations, and we can prevent this from happening. Um, Blood sugar is very important in kind of helping this whole process along. I know Dr. Carreno talks to patients all the time about trying to keep your blood sugars as stable as we can. It's these really, really high peaks and these really, really low troughs. Long term, those are the factors that really start to help cause problems with that, that sensory system. Um, that's very hard on your body to, to really handle when those blood sugars really uh, go up and down with a tremendous amount of variability. We want to keep things as stable as possible. Uh, classically, people that don't control their blood sugars well have a hard time with that neuropathy forming. It forms very easily for them sometimes. You have problems with your eyes, with the retinas in your eyes, and you can start to develop a lot of kidney problems as well. So anybody with diabetes, first goal is to keep their blood sugars as stable as possible. Um, these infections we talked about can form infections within the bone. Bone infections are a little bit trickier. We have to get rid of that diseased bone. Of course, sometimes that's at a cost where we have to change the patient's mechanics because of that. But believe me, you don't want a chronic bone infection for many reasons. Um, and certainly, our, our goal is to 
at, at, at sometimes, unfortunately, it becomes ultimately to save the patient's life to prevent a, kind of a life-threatening infection from developing from a bone infection. So that's unfortunately the role that amputations play. So after that fun stuff, we need a little visual palate cleanser. That feels better. So hopefully your breakfast is sitting better. So today, our, our take-home message, we have to prevent ulcerations. That, that is going to be our key goal. And we really have to address those risk factors head on. So the deformity part, we can do that in different ways. The neuropathy, once you get it, you've got it. Sometimes it's, it's almost impossible to reverse that. So that sometimes is something we have to live with. So we want to prevent that at all costs. And circulation, the great thing about living in this time in history, that's one factor we oftentimes have a, a role at changing, which is always wonderful. Um, that blood flow, like we talked about before, is mandatory to heal a problem. You know, you need circulation to heal something if you have a problem. Um, that, of course, we'll, we'll visit on a little bit more. We, we talked previously about those blood sugar levels needing to be stable, very important. And then pressure. Um, there's kind of a joke in my profession. What's the, the best thing to put on a, a wound or an ulcer to help heal it? It's really not what you put on it, it's what you take off it, and that's pressure. So that, that's very important. Um, really, two ways to, to get rid of pressure when you do have an ulceration. Um, kind of, of course, depends where it's at. If it's on the top of your foot, we need to be very aggressive with shoe gear and make sure that there's no pressure rubbing against where those bony prominences are causing the ulceration. If it's on the bottom of your foot, it's a little bit trickier. But again, we're lucky to be living at this time. There, there's a lot of ways we can do that. And of course, one option is direct correcting the deformity itself through surgical means. To do that, though, we need to make sure that that circulation is adequate to heal, or else we're going to have some major problems. Here's a nice example of a very high fashion shoe. No, I'm just kidding, but very functional shoe. Um, the, the toe box here in the shoe, you can see, is very elevated. It's called an extra depth shoe. The great thing about that is it reduces friction directly on those toes if they're buckled or if you have bunion deformities. And the beauty also is we can add material to the sole or the inside of the shoe to help offload pressure points. So we can get very creative and use pretty neat materials to basically reduce friction on the bottom of your foot. So those can be awesome. They're not cheap, though. Um, in addition to shoe gear, we talk about uh, putting appliances inside your shoes. Uh, this is an example of an insole that we would put in. And we can actually heat mold those right around the contour of your foot. We can actually put little pads to take pressure off. It's kind of fun. I'm terrible with arts and crafts, but this is my one excuse to play around with things in my lab. So it's kind of fun for me. Um, and this is just an example of someone who needed surgery to correct a deformity and stabilize their foot. Um, of course, to me, surgery is always the last resort. If we can do it without having to do surgery, so much the better. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to do this. And of course, we talked a little bit about this. We need a team approach. We all need to work together in the medical profession. Podiatrists love their vascular surgeons or, or endocrinologists, their internists, their cardiologists. I, I like to think of us as a big team working together. Communication is very important between team members. Key things here, though, that circulation has to be addressed before we move on. Um, a great way to do some cursory uh, studies on a patient is using a little Doppler where we put blood pressure cuffs at different levels and we can actually, in a sense, quantify blood flow at different areas of your leg and your foot. A very helpful test. The nice thing is they don't hurt. I hate needles myself. I hate being stuck by needles. So patients like me who are wimps love this kind of test because it doesn't hurt at all and it gives us a great deal of information. Here's an example of a, a guy just uh, having some, you can appreciate the, the cuffs at different layers at his thigh, his leg, and his ankle. And there's a Doppler there that the, the tech is holding, and it makes kind of a neat sound when they do the test too. But uh, it's very helpful. And we can kind of get a good handle on where the blood flow occlusion is just by doing this test. Now, if, if this test doesn't have great results and we need to get work a patient up a little bit further, the next step would be to get uh, a test called an arteriogram where you actually inject dye into the patient's uh, system and get x-rays. And this kind of shows here, you can appreciate, there's no dye uh, going through this little occlusion in their 
uh, artery in their lower leg there. So this is more invasive, of course, so you don't run to do this test first uh, in the order of things. You would do the Doppler study first. But this actually helps if someone needs bypass surgery, definitely need to have this, this procedure done so we get a handle on exactly where the blockage is. So working with a vascular surgeon is very important for any podiatrist. Um, they're, they're awesome. The team, basically, in a nutshell, is the vascular surgeon, the internist or endocrinologist. Cardiologists are awesome. Of course, I'm very pro-cardiologist with my wife, so shameless plug for my wife there. Um, nephrologist, neurologist, and, of course, a podiatrist or an orthopedist. Um, again, being proactive, the key here. So kind of the take-home things we, we get out of this today, aside from the, the, the big picture being preventative, but you know, things you can do to be pre preventative are if you can't see your feet very well, have someone take a look for you. Um, areas of red or warmth are never good signs. That's a sign that there's increased friction or irritation there. And if you have no one that can help you, be very careful, of course, but you can place a mirror on the floor and just raise up your foot and use the mirror to kind of take a look at things. Um, that can be very helpful. Um, but redness is never a good sign, guys. Um, hygiene is very important as well. Um, washing your feet, I know that sounds kind of funny, but I see some patients that don't have great hygiene sometimes. It's a little scary. Uh, using a good antibacterial soap, very important. Um, making sure that you kind of get rid of dead skin on your feet, that's one of the primary things. Every time we take a shower or bath and we use a washcloth or one of those little lather thingies, those little plastic things, that helps get rid of all that debris on your skin and helps it slough off, which your skin is normally turning over anyway. But you want to get rid of all that debris that harbors a lot of bacteria. That's very important. Uh, some people have back problems and they can't reach their feet. Using a back brush is always a good way to do it. That's very helpful. Um, you definitely want to kind of get between those web spaces and, and, and make sure that when you're done with your bath or your shower that you dry those out very thoroughly as well. Um, oftentimes you don't think about this, but water is a very bad drying agent, actually. So if you get moisture between your toes uh, chronically, that skin will actually almost dry out too much and start cracking in there. That's a great place for bacteria to kind of hang out and cause a nice little infection. So drying between those web spaces can be very helpful. Um, sometimes people can't get to their feet. A way to cheat and get around that is uh, just using a hair dryer on kind of a low heat setting, but just blow some warm air in there too, and that kind of helps. And powder, of course, is, is very good as well. Um, I like this picture of this hamburger here. I think my 15-year-old could probably eat two of those right now. But uh, we have to be smart too, though. I mean, things, again, control what we can control. Certainly our diet is in that. Um, tobacco, I, I don't think there's any place for tobacco. Um, alcohol, moderation being the key there, and, and the diet. Um, you know, I, I have a sweet tooth probably as big as Texas, so I have to be really careful with myself, too, but um, you just have to be smart. You can enjoy your life, too. You can have a little bit of treats once in a while, but just make sure it's once in a while. And again, our goal to try to keep that blood sugar as consistent and level as possible. And shoes play a huge role in this as well. Um, you know, it's probably a good idea for most patients with diabetes to wear a shoe inside their house just to protect them, protect them, especially if there's a possibility of a foreign body. Um, we'll see people dropping glasses in the kitchen all the time. Sometimes sewing needles are around. You'd be surprised at how many things get embedded in the human foot. Um, so please be careful around the house. Wearing a shoe definitely is protective. And my wife's going to kill me, but I used a couple of her shoes here. But choose your, <laughs> choose your shoes wisely. Um, obviously, a shoe like this, it, it probably I mean, most guys look at a shoe like this and they cringe and they wonder how women can walk in those. And I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, so, you know, use your head on that one. Again, my wife's going to kill me, but it brings the point home. Um, exercise. You know, the more you exercise, the better. I know we've got some good lectures coming up on that today as well. But the more you can be active, it's easier to keep your blood sugars regulated. Um, it's just good for your whole cardiovascular tree. So the more you can do it, the better. And that's a shameless plug of my son who went to state in golf and got a hole in one this year. So. Um, to, be, to be honest with you, I think walking is totally underrated. Um, I see so many runners in my practice with knee problems, hip problems. If there's any runners out there, I apologize. But, uh, 
you know, walking is so much easier on your joints, and it's so much easier to, to do something that you like to do. If you put some music on and go for a nice 20 or 30 minute walk, good for you. I mean, you're doing yourself a huge favor. Um, and if you mix it up with a little bit of bike riding or swimming, uh, it makes it fun. Exercise should be fun. If you like playing basketball, play basketball for half an hour. Whatever you like to do, do something you really enjoy. You're apt to stay with it long term. But certainly walking is a lot easier on your joints and your feet. Um, so the benefits, of course, it improves that cardiovascular health. Um, it helps if you do have a blockage. The great thing about walking is you can start to develop collateral circulation. You can kind of increase vessel formation that basically forms a little bypass on your own where you increase perfusion to those tissues that otherwise wouldn't get good circulation. So we, we talk about something that patients have called claudication where they might walk for a couple blocks and develop usually it's terrible calf pain or sometimes thigh pain. Thigh pain. A lot of times doctors are mean to those patients and we say we want you to walk through that. And if you need to stop for a couple minutes, that's fine, but try to keep pushing past that. That's when you develop those collateral circulation uh, vessels. That's always a good thing. And of course, exercise will keep your sugars level. Um, so in summary, basically, people that run into problem usually are the folks that can't feel pain. So we need to keep an eye on you that way. Um, we have to use that team approach that we talked about. And being aggressive offloading uh, people that have calluses or pre-ulcerations in a sense. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on right now with Medicare with diabetic shoes. It's kind of hazy right now who's covered, who's not covered. There's a lot of, unfortunately, uh, dollars being spent on shoes. Some of it probably inappropriately, but I would say it's made a huge difference reducing the people that have ulcerations. And if we can get people to really comply with good shoes and use this program, long term, we're going to be way ahead. And of course, again, our ultimate goal is to keep the foot attached to the leg. That's what we want. Um, you know, if you do get an ulceration, hiding your head in the sand is never a good option. The sooner we can start treating those folks, the better. I mean, you know, if you notice there's a problem on your daily inspection, call your regular doctor, call your, your podiatrist, call your priest, call someone, get, get somebody involved, do something, but don't just hide your head in the sand. Um, the sooner we get going, long term, you're going to be much happier. Um, again, that's just kind of what we talked about there. And really, your, your feet should last, last you a lifetime. You know, dentists always want your teeth to last you a lifetime. Uh, from my perspective, it's got to be your feet, too. So we, we need that to happen. Um, thank you very much. Um, I, I know that some of you may have questions, and I guess how we're going to do this, uh, there's some microphones uh, that we have. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, and they'll bring a microphone over so you can ask it. Any questions? I put you all to sleep, huh? Sorry. Well, if not, thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> she, she's, got, she's got a microphone coming. I have um, fungus under my toenails. What would you recommend in a case like that to eliminate that fungus without cutting my toenails off? Well, you know, uh, you know there's a couple options you have. Um, to me, if you have good feeling and it hurts you, sometimes it's more, the more aggressive approach is the better. Um, to me, surgery is probably not a great option for that problem. Again, that would be a last resort. But there's some medication that we can use now, antifungal medication, that works pretty well. It's very expensive. Um, the good thing is generics have come out, so the prices come down a little bit. It does have some potential side effects, especially liver issues that we're a little bit wary of. If you're taking a lot of other medication that's uh, metabolized by your liver, that kind of increases those risks even more. But the good old-fashioned podiatry uh, method to treat that problem it's still viable where we see patients every so often. We basically try to thin those nails down as much as we can and reduce the pressure there. So potentially there's less problems for ingrown toenails, infections that way. Um, the fungus typically doesn't spread you know, systematically and you won't get a fungal infection anywhere else typically from that. So it's pretty well localized. But you know, if it's a problem where it hurts or potentially gonna cause a secondary bacterial infection, we need to be more aggressive with those. Thank you.
You're welcome. You're welcome. I was diagnosed 25 years ago as a diabetic, and I went down to a seminar in Des Moines, and I was just appalled and shocked. Every third person 25 years ago were amputated. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's how far it's come in 25 years. Thank goodness. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Oh, my, my pleasure. The people with um, bad feet and the number of shoes that are available, could you tell us what kind of shoes to get that are practical, like Vel with, with Velcro? Um, uh, there was a picture of that running shoe up there. I don't know if you guys appreciated that. But uh, to me, a running shoe for people that walk or just daily activities is probably one of the best shoes you can use in that it's going to be very supportive. Typically with that nylon mesh, if you have a foot deformity, it'll conform around those without putting a lot of pressure on your foot. And they do make Velcro, Velcro closures, which are very nice, especially if you have back problems, it's just much easier. So a good running shoe, there are some great brands right now, uh, Brooks, Asics, New Balance, Saucony. Um, I, I'll throw Nike in there just because my kids would kill me if I didn't. But, but, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of great options right now. And then, then you go, take it a step further, you go into the prescription shoes, and those are even better. Yeah, I have flat feet, and I was just wondering how much success, success you have with um, helping um, with orthotics with flat feet. Um, we, I'm pretty happy with where we go with, with orthotics. Um, you know, sometimes we have to try different materials. It's always, it, it's a little bit more sometimes, I hate to say this, but of a, an art versus a science. So you kind of have to work with the patient. Sometimes patients can't tolerate a, a material that you might want to use to really control their foot better. Um, with diabetic patients, I tend to be a little bit more, um, less aggressive using really rigid materials just because of the pressure issues. We'll use something that's got a nice lining on top of it that's very soft. So if they do have pressure points, we can kind of offload those and control their foot as well. But again, there's been so many great advances in the materials that we can use in medicine now. It's, it's, it's great. So I, I'd say our success is very good. Thank you. You bet. What is the uh, best way to prevent like ingrown toenails? <laughs> I get that all the time. Um, the, the old answer is cut your nails straight across. The one problem is a lot of us don't have a flat toenail, though. A lot of times they curve down in the corners. Those are tough. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, if you cut those straight across, you're still going to have some pressure in those corners. What I recommend, it sounds kind of goofy, I actually recommend cutting your nails a little bit longer than you might think so that the edge of that nail is actually past the end of that pulp of your toe or hanging off your skin a little bit further. That kind of increases the surface area where that nail could put pressure in. So in a sense, you're having a much greater surface area and you're not having pinpoint pressure on the tip of that nail. I would certainly try that first. Then if that doesn't work, it sounds goofy, but then we're aggressive and we take those corners out when we trim patients' toenails and kind of remove those. If that still is a problem, um, toenail surgery just to remove that offending corner so you don't get an infection all the time can be very helpful. You talk about washing and drying your feet. Should you also moisturize? Yes, um, especially now with, with winter coming, with uh, the heat going on, it really dries your skin out that much more. Um, if you have something, an emollient that you like to use on your hands every night, that would be fine with your feet. It would work very well. Just be kind of careful putting lotion between your toes, though. That kind of gets back to what we talked a little bit earlier, where that moisture kind of trapped in there over a chronic period of time can actually break your skin down and cause other problems. So certainly you can use a moisturizer on the top of your feet, the bottom of your feet, your ankles, and maybe use powder between your toes still. Doctor, when you were talking about um, running shoes, are, I mean, you see them advertised as running shoes or walking shoes or whatever. Are the running shoes the ones that we need to look for as opposed to walking shoes? Well, yeah, you know, good question. The, the, the real difference there just being the, the, the upper of the shoe, most walking shoes are all leather still. And uh, anybody who goes for a long walk in Iowa in winter will probably appreciate the leather versus the nylon mesh because the cold air goes right through the, the nylon very quickly. That being said, typically the nylon mesh is much more comfortable. Um, it accommodates swelling a lot better. It offloads pressure much better. So I would say for most of the year, a running shoe, if, if you're comfortable, and that would be better. 
Um, what I like about a running shoe versus a walking shoe, usually the, the midsole of that shoe is designed to absorb shock much better as well. And most of us walk on hard surfaces when we go for a walk, and that helps. It's going to reduce the wear and tear on your knees, <coughs> your, your lower back as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Do we have a question over here? If you could just raise your hand, sir, they'll get you. <laughs> Thank you. Excuse me, uh, you talked about uh, spiking of glucose numbers, and do you have any parameters on that? And the second question is, with mesh shoes, I somehow lift the, my big toe and wear the mesh very quickly. Am I walking wrong, uh, or is that a, a natural thing with some people, or how, how can that be handled? Um, first, first issue with the blood sugar, and Dr. Crane will probably argue with me on this a little bit, but. I'm happy if people are under 120, and you're probably happy if they're around 100, I would guess, typically. <laughs> and, and that A1C test is very helpful, too. That's that long-term look at your blood sugars. And the number there is anything under 7. He's okay with that, too. So good. But, but yeah, the, those, those parameters, 120, if you can kind of be in that ballpark all the time or most of the time, that's great. I, I work... The spiking, eh, boy. Uh, again, the, the closer you can kind of stay to that, that 120 is better. But yeah, it's funny. Some people, their sugars are all over the place. They, they still don't develop that neuropathy. Somehow, by the grace of God, someone's watching out for them. But I've seen people with blood sugars in the 230s, 240s consistently. That, that's a rarity, though, that, that don't develop problems with that. But yeah, you, you don't want them to get real high. Your, your second question about the hole in the top of the shoe, it's a very common problem. Usually what we'll see is people when they walk, when they swing forward, it's kind of funny, but if you have tight muscles in your calf, believe it or not, you have to actually pull harder to swing your foot up for your next step forward. And the tendon that actually pulls you the most drastically at your ankle is the tendon ultimately that goes to your big toe. So that tendon pulls your ankle, unfortunately at the same time that big toe goes for a ride, and it actually hits the inside of that, the shoe and can wear away that, that mesh pretty easily. Uh, you know, so sometimes I'll actually have patients be proactive and really try to stretch your calf muscles. That can be very helpful long term that reduces the wear and tear on that tendon in the front and that might save your shoes a little bit. Or going to a shoe, that extra depth shoe that we talked about where it's a prescription shoe but you've got more room inside that toe box. That can help. Sir, I'm a long-time diabetic. Uh, I, for years, have worn virtually nothing but diabetic-designed shoes. Periodically, uh, I get a, on the top of my foot, usually starting on the outside and coming up, a very intense pulsating pain that lasts just for a short time period of time, maybe I may go two or three minutes and then all of a sudden I get another shot of that that's just almost unbearable. Uh, it's not as frequent now as it has been in past years, but well, last week out in Denver we had uh, walked a great deal that day and in the evening I had another episode of that and I really don't know I haven't found anything that I can do to give instant relief for that. Um, good question. I hate to say this, but there's a lot of things that can cause pain like that where it's transient and very intense. Um, you know, if it's a chronic problem, you always worry about arthritic conditions. There's 28 bones in the foot, so there's so many little joints in the foot, especially in the mid part of your foot. Um, it's a very common thing that we'll see people that do develop arthritis in those joints. And arthritis is one of those goofy things where it can just, just knock you out almost. It's so intense. And then maybe you don't think about it for a while, and then you're laying in bed, and all of a sudden you get a zinger that just is amazing. And it can last a little while then. 
what probably what I would recommend would be to, to, to see someone, I'd be happy to see, or see someone get an x-ray of your foot and, and to have someone work you up to see what the cause is. You're welcome. Uh, is uh, toenail fungus more common among diabetics than the general population? And if so, what can you do about it? Um, well, good question. Um, I don't think statistically there's a huge difference between non-diabetics and diabetics with that condition. Um, and, and what you can do about it, uh, basically we visited on that before, uh, conservative things like trimming the nail down and really debulking the nail mechanically can be very helpful. Um, there are medications we can use uh, if, if that's warranted. And as a last resort, surgery to remove the affected toenail if it's causing pain or potential problems with infections. Um. I um, would like to know, with the winter weather coming, you'd like to change your shoes at the door. So I was thinking about getting my husband indoor, outdoor slippers. Would that be acceptable? Yes. <clears throat> um, th there's a new product I just saw. It was pretty neat. It hasn't really hit the market yet, but it's going to be a shoe or a slipper that actually you can change the outer sole when you come in the house. So that's pretty cool. Um, we'll see how that develops, but it's a neat idea at least. I'm always yelling at my kids to take their shoes off in the house anyway. But We're talking about strange pains. The pain that occurs at the very end of your toes, and it's kind of a burning. Uh, is that related to the diabetic situation or to the, uh, the muscular? Um, good, good question. Unfortunately, th there can be another variable in there as well. Um, sometimes circulation can cause pain in, in digits, especially at night. We call it rest pain. When people, when, when you sleep at night, your heart rate slows down a little bit, your activity levels slow down. When that heart rate slows down quite a bit, though, it does kind of reduce your overall perfusion or how much blood you pump. And if your circulation's a little bit on the, the, the margin anyway, when you throw that into the equation, um, sometimes those tissues don't get enough oxygen and that actually wakes you up at night. It causes a great deal of pain. So that's always one thing I always worry about when people have pain at the tips of their toes especially, um, especially that wakes them up at night. But certainly neuropathic pain can, can do that as well. <clears throat> is there a test to find out what the problem is? Um, absolutely. Um, I, I would see someone and have them do that neurologic testing with the monofilament wire and the tuning fork test just as a cursory test we can get a lot more involved with, there's studies called nerve conduction studies and EMG studies that can look at those nerves and see how they're working in your feet. It's a little bit painful. It uses needles and it measures the speed at which your nerves send responses, but it can provide great information and neurologists use that quite a bit. And then the, the blood flow studies can be very helpful as well. You're welcome. I need to find out, I have, um some real bad calluses on my feet, and they're hard, they're white, they crack open and bleed, and I know I don't wear socks and shoes very often, and I go outside barefoot a lot, but I soak them for like two or three hours trying to get them soft enough that I can use my pet egg thing to scrape them to get them, you know, sure. so that they'll look halfway decent, but they're, they're just horrible, and sometimes when I walk on them, they hurt, and they're hard, and when you go to hit them, you don't hardly feel nothing. I can't feel hardly nothing on them. What is the best thing that I could do for them? Well, just a, a, like a home remedy, sometimes just using a really good emollient that you'd use on your hands before you go to bed at night. Um, and then seal that with Vaseline, just good old fashioned Vaseline petroleum jelly. That kind of helps seal that moisturizer inside your skin. It actually lets it penetrate a little bit deeper too and put a sock on. But wearing socks and shoes, believe it or not, during the daytime, will reduce that cracking a little bit. Some of that's mechanical, believe it or not. Some of that, you get a lot of shear. Every time you walk, your heel bone rocks quite a bit. And on bare surfaces, or if you're just wearing sandals, just that drag between the skin and the sole of the sandal can really put a lot of tension on your skin, and that can kind of lead to cracking as well. So a, a sock, and a funny, sock technology has come a long way too. We're just talking about technology in general today, but runner socks nowadays have a lot of acrylic fibers in them. Um, and it's kind of neat. It's almost the same feel as Teflon. So it really reduces the drag between your skin and the sole when you run or walk. So it can be very helpful that way. 
And it's actually very good. It's almost like wool pulling away moisture from your skin. Um, wool used to be kind of the gold standard as far as fabrics wicking away moisture from your skin. But acrylic is very close too. So if you ever go to a sporting goods store, maybe take a look for the acrylic socks too. They'll, they'll be helpful for you. Doctor, uh, up here. What causes the hammer toenail? How, what does that grow down instead of straight out? The, the hammer toe or a toenail? The toenail. It goes, instead of going up, it grows down. Oh, I see what you mean. It curls. Uh, so sometimes, yeah, nails curl around the tip of the toe. Mm -hmm. it, it can be a couple things. Sometimes it's the shape of the toe itself where if, if your toe is crooked enough where you're kind of walking on the tip, it's actually that, that pressure as your, as your toe kind of moves forward inside your shoe and grips a little bit, the nail will actually kind of conform to that and start growing downward as well. Mm -hmm. Th those sometimes can cause a lot of problems. I've seen a, a fair amount of patients that get basically perforations or um, there's so much impingement between the edge of the nail and underneath their toe that you can get an ulceration there too. So be, be careful with that. Okay, thank you. You bet. Oh, one more, okay. I've been told that uh, diabetics should have their toenails trimmed probably by medical staff. What is the reasoning for that? Um, good question. Um, it, it's probably just a good idea in general. Some, sometimes, for a, a couple reasons, sometimes nobody looks at patients with diabetes at their feet. So just by seeing someone in the medical profession, whether it's a nurse or a doctor or a podiatrist, someone's keeping tabs on you and kind of making sure that there's no problems. Probably the second thing would be to avoid problems in that, you know, when you do it yourself, it's kind of hard to, to make sure you're doing a really good job. Um, and when someone else does it, they have an easier vantage point looking at things for you and it's just easier um, from a logistical standpoint to kind of work on someone's toenails. So that, that can be very helpful. But you know, we, we like to make sure people that don't have problems with infections or ulcerations and kind of making sure that their nails are cut properly can be very uh, kind of a proactive step in that. And sometimes it's a circulation thing too. Sometimes people don't have great circulation and if you get cut or nicked, um, we, we have a kind of a joke in my profession, we call it bathroom surgery, where people are doing some work and it's like it becomes kind of a, a, a crazy situation where they get cut themselves and, and can get kind of an infection because of that or they can't heal because of circulation problems. So th that's another reason. I had a question, like if your foot gets very chilled during winter, is there a cause for concern? I'm sorry, can you say that again? The f my foot does get very cold during winters. Is that uh, due to poor circulation or something for concern? Um, no, I mean, th that's a real common thing. Welcome to Iowa. You know, it's, it's cold here. And, um, you know, certainly it, it can kind of exacerbate problems. If you, if you have, uh, there, there's some people that we de develop something called chill blains or, or pernio, where those blood vessels really constrict in that cold weather. Um, so you're very sensitive. Your autonomic system is very sensitive to that cold that actually does almost reduce blood flow to the point where it's extremely painful. Um, you need to really be careful in those situations. You need to, it sounds funny, but you need to wear a hat on your head. Believe it or not, that helps your feet stay warmer where it keeps your, your core temperature. At a, the, the one place most of us lose heat in the winter is through our heads. So the goal is always to keep your brain warm and your vital organs warm. That way you won't be hogging all the circulation for those vital organs. It's kind of goofy, but uh, to me, in one sense, feet are the Rodney danger field of your body. They get no respect. So if it's cold out, obviously your brain's demanding all this, the, the warmth and the circulation. Your heart and lungs need it too. So it, it just makes sense that your feet would be shunted and you would reduce blood flow to your feet and your fingers for the expense of keeping everything vital, nice and warm, and having good circulation there. So things you can do are you know, wear a hat so you keep your head warm, wear good clothing on, on the outside. That should help keep your feet warmer. Of course, wearing wool socks you know, and shoes that are, are thermally insulated can be very helpful as well. Um, hunters have these cool socks that have these little battery packs that are heated. Those are awesome. And then they have those little calcium uh, iron things where you can pop them and people ski with those where you can throw them in your gloves or inside your shoes. Um, those can be really helpful too in the winter if you're out for long periods. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it, guys.